Chapter 8, we start into our first of three chapters dealing with contract law. Contract law is very relevant for just individuals to understand as well as businesses. Um, so basically, a contract is an agreement that can be enforced in a court of law between, you know, two or more parties. It, it provides security for buyers and sellers. So you know, you know, that if people don't fulfill their end of the deal, you can always sue them. And, 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 and what that would be, if they don't fulfill their end of the deal, that is considered a breach of that contract. And then if they breach the contract, you can sue them for damages. Um, so when you enter into a contract, the person who proposes the agreement is the offeror. So if I'm going to want to sell my used car and I put a sign out there, you know, $5,000 your best offer, I'm the offeror. Then the person who would come and say, hey, I'll, I'll buy your car for, for $5,000, they're the offeree. They're the person who's accepting that offer. And like with everything with business law, I feel like everything is always a reasonable person standard. That's how we kind of judge everything in law is what would a reasonable person do or what would a reasonable person think? So you want to understand the requirements of a contract. And what this is saying is this is these requirements have to be met in order for it to be enforceable in a court of law. So, I mean, you could have you could be missing some of those and still have a contract but you couldn't take it to court then if the person breaches. So we have agreement, which is offer and acceptance. We have legal consideration, legal capacity, and it has to be for a legal purpose. So we'll talk more about each one of those four. The first two will be covered in this chapter, and then the second two will be covered in the next chapter. Um, again, I always talk about defenses. So defenses are what the person, if the, if you've been, if you've breached that contract and it's going to court, again, what would you say um, that you, that the contract lacked voluntary consent? You really, truly did not have agreement. And we'll talk about that too more, that it could be due to undue influence or that you were under duress at that time, which means you could void that contract. There's going to be certain contracts that have to be in writing to be enforceable, and we'll have a list of those as well. So then you could say, well, this is a prenuptial agreement. We agreed to it verbally. Well, it has to be in writing to be enforceable, so it would not be a valid contract. Um, then we get into all these different types, and these are good ones to maybe make flashcards of so that you kind of understand the different different types of contracts. A bilateral contract is by far, <clears throat> by far the most common, and it is when the offeror and the offeree exchange a promise. So um, Joe promises to sell his car to Sally when she pays the agreed upon price. Or you have a roofer come and give you an estimate. They say, hey, we'll charge you $8,000 for a new roof. And you say, okay, sounds like a good deal. I'll take that. You know, you sign the quote. That's a bilateral contract. It's a promise for a promise. They promise to put a roof on your house and you promise to pay them. Unilateral contracts are kind of unique. And what happens with a unilateral contract is the offerer um, makes an offer out there, but the offeree can only accept it by performing the action. So the example that I give is if there's a, you know, a, a $50 reward for a lost pet. So there was a lost cat in my neighborhood. The owners went around with a little sign, hung it on the, the um, telephone poles and said, $50 reward for finding our cat. Well, I couldn't go to their house and say, hey, I accept your offer. They'd be like, well, good for you, but find my cat. So the key to that is the first person who finds the cat or the person who actually performs the action can accept that reward or accept that offer of $50. So it isn't a question of a promise for a promise. It's a, it's a question of a promise for an action. And you don't even care who performs it. You just want it done. Like you just want your pet found. There's formal versus informal. So a formal contract requires it to be in a special form, like it has to be notarized um, or it has to be in writing. 
um, and it maybe has a certain seal or things like that, you know, there's different things that require those types of, of um, formalities. Informal contracts are by far the most common, and those can be verbal contracts. They could be writing but not notarized or, or you know, with any special seal or mark. Just a, like, a, like a guy who gives you a quote to fix your roof would be an informal contract. Um, executed contracts versus ex ex executory contracts. Executed means it's fully performed. It's done. You know, you sold your car for $5,000. You delivered them the title. They delivered you the, the check. And it's an executed contract, fully performed on both sides. Executory means it's in process. So maybe say with the, the roof, for example, he gives you the quote of $8,000 and says, I, I need 25% down to buy supplies. So you give him $2,000 and he's out ordering the materials, maybe has come and done some prep work, but it's not done. So that is an executory contract. It's partially completed. It's not finished. It's not fully paid. Express versus implied. Express means the terms of the contract are set forth. So they're either in writing or they've been or orally communicated. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to sell my car for $5,000. You're going to pay me with a cashier's check. So, I mean, we know exactly what the terms of the contract are. An implied contract is based on past history with that person. So, and then there has to be some criteria involved too, but the, 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 the person has actually provided some sort of product or service. They provided that product or service with the expect to be compensated and the defendant had a chance to refuse it, but did not. So my example is lawn care providers. And some of them are, are kind of onto these contract laws and have changed where you do have to sign up every year. But there was a time when say you had the guy who came and treated your lawn every year. Um, he would just come. It's April. He comes to treat your lawn for dandelions or whatever. He comes. He leaves his little ticket on the door, and you're expected to pay. And it's because you had a contract with him last year or, or at some point in time you started that contract. So he just assumes it's going to carry forward unless you cancel it. So he provided a service. He gave you the bill. He expects to be compensated you could have contacted him in January or February and said, hey, I want out, don't come anymore, um, but you did not. So that would be an implied contract. It's based on the history that you have with that person. And again, the person does expect to get paid. Then we have valid, voidable, or a void contract. So all of these three go back to those elements. Do we have all of our elements satisfied? So a valid contract would say, yes, there's there's legal agreement, there's legal consideration, it's for a legal purpose, and everybody has legal capacity, so we can enforce that in a court of law. A voidable contract would say, one person in this contract has the right to void it. So it, they could be a minor under the age of 18, they can void a contract, um, or if they were under duress or undue influence and they really truly did not have legal agreement. So the, the agreement was kind of forced upon them. Um, a void contract is when one of those is missing. So it's, it's for an illegal purpose. You're buying marijuana from the supplier on the corner. It's, it's still illegal in the state of Ohio. So that would not be a valid contract. Um, so now we get into the different components. So again, this chapter, we'll, we'll talk about agreement and consideration. So agreement is offer and acceptance. Um, in order to have it completely correct, it has to be the mirror image rule. It must match, the acceptance must, must match exactly what the offer was. So say with my car example, I put a sign out that says you can, you know, my car's for sale for $5,000. If somebody says, hey, I'll take it, I'll have a check for you for $5,000, that's a mirror image rule. If they came to me and said, eh, $5,000 is a little high, will you take $4,500? Now they have given me a counter offer, so now our roles are reversed. They are now the offeror and I'm the offeree and I can choose to reject it and then make them another offer or I could choose to accept it. Um, so again, but then eventually you'll get to that point where it is that mirror image where you're accepting the offer exactly how it's, how it's stated. Um, the offer is a promise to perform a future act or um, 
pay a certain dollar amount, it has to be a serious intention. So it can't just be someone saying, oh, you know, someday I want to sell this house for $200,000. That's like a, a wish. It's a statement of intention. It's something that's going to happen in the future, but it, I'm not listing it right now. So I do, I do not have serious intention. There must be definite terms, so it can't be vague um, to say, eh, in the next 10 years, I'd like to sell it for around two hundred to 300000 I mean, that would be too vague, obviously. Um, and it must be communicated to the offeree. So the, so the person must know about the offer to be able to accept it. So going back to my lost pet example, say if I didn't know that that person was offering $50 reward for their pet, but I found their pet and I took it to their house because I knew where they lived, I can't ask for the $50 if I don't know it was even, I mean, I can't accept an offer that I don't know about. They might still give it to me if they're good, upstanding people, but if I didn't know about it, I can't necessarily accept it. Um, you can, um, there can be revocation or termination of the offer. So you could withdraw that offer at any time prior to accepting it. Um, or you could terminate an offer. So offers could be terminated by saying, hey, I, I, I changed my mind. I don't want to sell my car. Or a counter offer rejects that first offer and creates a new one that, again, you could reject. There are certain circumstances where the law comes in and says that this offer needs to be, uh, is no longer valid. So if it's a lapse of reasonable time, if it's a destruction of the property, um, death of either parties, or if doing, doing, fulfilling that contract would become illegal. So again, if it's putting my car up for sale, if I had the sign in the window and then decided not to sell it and two years later someone comes, hey, I'll accept your offer, um, again, that'd be a lapse of time. The offer is no longer valid. If the car were totaled, it's destroyed. If I were to die, I can't sell my I can't sell my property if I'm not alive. If it became illegal to sell your car in your driveway, again, those are all things that could terminate that offer. Um, unilateral contracts, where again it requires action to accept it, those cannot be revoked once you've substantially performed the act. So my lost pet example is probably not the greatest idea unless you're saying, okay, well, I'm carrying the pet in my hand. The person looks out the window and says, oh, hey, forget it. You know, I'm taking that $50 offer off the table. Well, you got the cat. Um, but they do give an example of like a race. So like, you know, sometimes there'll be um, you, the first person to, you know, swim across this river gets $1,000 or something like that. If you're halfway across the river, they can't revoke that offer because you've already substantially performed it. How you accept it is either through any authorized means, whether again, it's, it's email, fax, US mail, however they're telling you that the offer could be accepted. Sometimes there's a mailbox rule where it has to be mailed. In that case, it's as soon as it's postmarked, as soon as you send it, not necessarily when the person receives it, because you know that can take a few days. Um, online offers, there's normally an accept button that you have to click and maybe put in your initials, and there'll be provisions that'll explain how payment needs to happen. Um, you know, so like say it's an eBay contract, the money goes into a PayPal account, it's frozen until the person has received the goods, has an opportunity to look at them, possibly say, hey, this isn't right, um, and then the money is released. Um, so legal consideration, again, it's either um, it's either you're going to give money or you're going to give services or, or a product or something of value. The courts are never going to hear, well, is it adequate? Did I get a good deal? You know, because that's very subjective and um, the courts would be just bombarded with cases if every time we feel like, hey, I didn't get a good deal on that used car that I bought. Um, there just would be way too many cases. So what the courts are going to look at is to say, was there a chance for both parties to to bargain, to, you know, to offer, counter offer? You know, was there a chance for the person to quote around and find a better deal? As long as there was that chance, then they're going to consider it adequate consideration. Um, it cannot be for any past transaction. So again, it has to be either a promise to pay money or provide goods or services 
Um, those are the most common legally sufficient one. You couldn't say, hey, you know, I took care of your children for the 10 years that you were in school and now you owe me $20,000. I mean, that's already done. It's in the past. There, That is not legal sufficient. Um, the settlement of claims. So this comes in to say, okay, well, what if everything isn't exactly perfect? Um, you can have a cord and satisfaction where maybe you're going to say, okay, to the roofer, I agreed to pay you $8,000. You didn't quite, um, you know, do what I was expecting. Maybe, you know, I wanted new gutters and downspouts. It wasn't clear that I wasn't getting those. I'm not going to pay you $8,000. I'll pay you $7,000. Well, then the, the, the roofer might say, okay, that's fine. I accept that. So that would be a cord and satisfaction. We've come to a new agreement for a lower amount. Um, again, performance is the most common way for contracts to be settled. They're just completely performed and it discharges everybody from liability. Um, there can be promissory estoppel where it, the courts are going to bar somebody from backing out of that promise. So say, for instance, you know, you had a job offer and you sold your house and quit your job and moved your family across the state. And then all of a sudden that person goes, eh, you know, changed my mind. Um, then you could take them to court to say, hey, I, you know, I made these significant life changes. I've relied on this and now I'm suffering. Um, and there can be damages that you could sue for or the courts could say um, you, that you, that person cannot back out. That is our first part of contract law.